All right, so now that we're all here, let's, let's get talking about Windows. That's what you're all here to talk about, right? <laughs> what? Don't, don't laugh. I mean, come on, Windows is okay. Well, that's what you came to talk about, right? <clears throat> I thought about changing this today to be uh, the pharmaceutical. You know, I was going to start talking about that. Really, we're going to talk about making your first puppet stage and how to you know, build your own marionettes. How many of you have heard of Puppet Labs, heard of Puppet and what we do? Okay, most of the room. All right, that, that's going to be rough. <laughs> How many of you are using Puppet in production? Okay, all right, so a little less fearful now. There's, uh, because this is an intro talk about what Puppet is, what it, what it can do, um, and I'm going to do some quick demos on stuff you can do with it and try to just get you guys into the whole idea of of configuration management, and especially about how Puppet looks at systems and how to manage systems. It's an entirely different world. So um, those of you that are, are familiar with Puppet, have you gone and like tried to play with it and you just haven't gotten in production? Show of hands there. Okay. So for the most part, everybody's just heard of it, but they, they want to explore it more. Is that correct? All right. But I think I've made the right presentation. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alistair. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout uh, what's going on here, either shout them out, raise your hand, whatever you want. I'm not the kind of guy who likes to wait till the end for questions. I always forget the questions I have by the end of the presentation. So just call them out. I'm happy to take questions. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm Ryan Coleman, Puppet Labs. I'm a professional services engineer. So my job is to fly around the world and help people use Puppet, learn how to use Puppet, solve problems with Puppet, that kind of stuff. That's all I do, I'm a puppet master, and you know, that's kind of it. Before that, I was here, I was a grumpy sysadmin at Penn State, and, uh, and worked at, this is a, a rather large, large projector. I, I go to these trainings a lot, and we have these dinky little projectors, and you need to put up code, and you need to do examples, and it's, I always want this to, to do trainings on, so it's gonna be a little wasted here, but yeah. So I started at Penn State, Linux Systems Administrator, doing uh, an AIT at Penn State. How many Penn State here versus non-Penn State? Penn State, raise your hand. Okay, all right, you guys aren't gonna really care about this. Um, those of you that did raise your hands, I think you all know me from, from Penn State. But I managed central Linux systems. I had one other guy, two Linux server admins, um, forced to scale a bunch of Linux servers, right? We started with you know, 20, got up to 100, just the two of us. One guy was mostly on storage. We used IBM GPF, GPFS. So he was basically busy, and I became the only Linux admin and managing all these servers, and that's frustrating me, having to go in, log in, repeat the work I've already done, and just generally do systems administration the old manual way. We, as a AIT, as a shop, is, is very much old school sysadmins that do things the old way. Puppet wasn't there at the time, and that's a tool I discovered on my own before I decided to join the corporation, um, just to help me do my job better and help me get to the, to the you know the pub a little earlier, which is often our motto. Before that, I was at again at Penn State, the graduate school where I managed a. Um, a mix of Windows, Mac, and Linux servers for an academic unit and manage Windows and Mac desktops. So caveat, I did manage Mac desktops, but it was about, <coughs> was about a dozen of them. I didn't really use any automation. I kind of just stuck within Windows, or yeah, Windows. I stuck within Apple's walled garden, and that, that worked just fine for 12 machines. Um, <coughs> how many of you are managing Mac desktops in the room? Okay, how many less than 50? More than 50? More than 100? More than 200? More than 500? More than 1,000? All right. So my experience with managing Mac desktops, Puppet, you know, it would have been useful, but it wouldn't have been that great. For most of you holding up your hands today, I hope Puppet will really be useful for you because it, it and as we get into this, it does a couple of things really well that once you grasp it, once you take advantage of it, it will make your administration experience a lot easier and it'll make managing all those various machines a whole lot simpler. So the golden image mentality, I've been hearing a lot about that this week. 
it's a great mentality. I didn't get a chance to, to see Alistair's presentation on it or anyone else's. I've been kind of frantically doing puppet stuff because I, I kind of squeaked into this conference. I'm supposed to be doing my day job this week. And so it's been a little rough. But this is how I did things at the graduate school. It worked well, like I said, for about 12 machines. But I always ran into the problem of what do I do once I get this image out there? This image has all my OS on it. Everything's configured just the way I want it. What happens when there's a patch release or you know, I want to control my software updates? Maybe I want to switch servers. Maybe I want to change you know, their mounting Samba against this server. Now I need to mount, have it mount against this server. Right? Any of those things that happen once you get those images out in the field, I had a little bit of problem managing that. There's tools like ARD for getting you there. You can just SSH in the machines. And that got me there. But I was always really frustrated with this concept. Before I anger too many of you, are people using Golden Image for their entire life cycle, not just initial deployment? A couple of you? So, so please don't take me uh, as being a jerk here. I'm not saying that it's a bad way of doing things. It just didn't work for me. If it works for you, that's awesome. But I started, and I did this in the Linux world too. Um, when I started at AIT, we had VMware templates that represented the OS at the state we wanted it in for whatever the roles were. It was a web server, it was a file server, and that just sucks. Now I gotta clone this VMware machine, and the instant I create it, especially on Linux, everything changes. There's Red Hat's always pushing out point releases, there's always configuration changes to make. That image approach just doesn't work for me. So we're gonna talk about a slightly different way to do it, but I think the imaging approach is so advantageous for quickly putting out an OS that meets the base level of configuration you want, and then you expect that image to just you know, change as soon as you deploy it. So Puppet is, is a slightly older slide. We do do Windows now, but um, are any of you managing Windows? Okay, more than I thought. I was expecting just my buddy Phil in the back to raise his hands, but uh, we, do, we do manage Windows now, in addition to all the other, other platforms and some that we don't list here. But Puppet, I think most of you know, it's an open source product for managing these systems. We've got a language that we're going to talk about in a little bit, and it's about abstracting all of these pieces away so that you can focus on how do I want my systems to look, tweak the bits where you need to tweak, you know, like Windows has a different slash than Unix-based systems, right? Changing those little bits. But overall, you should be using the same tool that, that models the state of the systems. Because at the end of the day, you're doing similar things. It may be a different platform, but you're still managing services. You're still managing configuration files. You're still deploying packages, right? All that stuff is the same. So we at Puppet Labs think we should have a, a similar tool for that. Are there any questions so far? What are the blue and the uh, oh, blue represents something we support in our commercial product. Orange is, except for Windows now, or Windows will be blue. It was open source, and now it's supported in our commercial product. So that's a good distinction to make. Puppet Labs, founded in 2005 or so, it's an open source product. Everything we do is open source. We love open source. We live it, we breathe it. Everything I show you today, you can go and download our software for free, use it, succeed with it. Many companies do that. Last year, we launched what we call Puppet Enterprise, which is our commercial offering. That packages up the little bits and installs them for you with a script so that it's a little less work right out of the gate to get that going. We've improved our GUI a little bit. We still have an open source GUI, but we've tacked on a piece of functionality that I'll show you today. Nothing that you can't do in the open source version, just something that we've, you know, we have some web people and they've done it. The other part of that is commercial support. If you're having problems with Puppet, if you need support, you need training, you need whatever, you're paying for that with the commercial edition. So the distinction here is that some of these platforms we will commercially support. Others work perfectly fine in the open source product and will probably someday be commercially supported. It's just we're a small company now of about 80 people. So no commercial support for you, no, Blue is commercial. Oh, Blue is commercial. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Ubuntu, and we just released either this week or next week a uh, release for um, what's the code name for the new one that starts with a P? Pelican? It's not Pelican. Pengolin. Okay. Pengolin? Is that what it is? Pangolin. Is that related to a penguin? No, it's more like an anteater. Okay. 
I had that way wrong. Somebody want to come up and draw it? No? Okay. So anyway, we're, we're about to support that platform as well. Uh, in addition to Debian 6 and Red Hat 6, and uh, boy, Solaris is a, in a sad state of affairs right now, but we do support it. Anyway, um, and OS 10 is actually shouldn't be blue. It was, it was flipped blue uh, back in when we were doing this, and then we, we realized we needed to change our focus, so we don't yet support it in the commercial edition. Um, but open source wise, it's, it's perfectly supported and I imagine by the next release or so, we'll just flip the switch for OS X. It's, it's one of our older platforms in the open source side and it's just a matter of we need support engineers that are gonna be dedicated because once we flip the color here, our support engineers have to be experts of the platform and how to support Puppet on it and how to you know, make sure that what you're paying for is actually valuable and we just don't, you know, we don't have that yet. So. Puppetlabs.com slash jobs. If you're looking to join and help make that happen, we're always hiring as startups are want to do. So, yeah. So I covered open source, commercial edition. Any questions there? All right. So a couple more crap slides before we get through to the, the good stuff. Lots of companies are using Puppet. It's been around for a long time. People are very successful with it. I don't really know anymore which ones of these are using our commercial product. I think most of them are open source. For instance, Google's using open source not for their web services, not for their bread and butter, but for uh, OS X desktop deployments. Uh, unfortunately, Google's a bit of a secret sauce company, so they haven't shared much of how they're managing their desktops, what they're doing, what their puppet code looks like. That's all you know, locked behind the vault. But people that were responsible for that deployment did contribute a number of features for Puppet for managing OS X, which we'll talk about today. And uh, yeah, any questions on companies using that? Any of you work for any of these companies? Okay. Because I'm lying about all of them, so I didn't want to get called out on it. <laughs> all right, uh, yeah, let's move forward then. So Puppet's model is a bit like this. Up top, we have a declarative language, which is how you, you write as code what your systems look like, what the state should be. It's pretty simple language. We'll take a look at it, we'll work with it. But you define what a system looks like, what a system looks like. You have the option, number two here, to simulate what the difference would be between the state you've declared and what's running on the system. We'll talk about how we achieve that, but that's one of our, our major competitive advantages right now is we have this well, inspection ability so that we can simulate what would happen without actually doing it, because it's tight. Uh, three here is the main piece, right? So in one, you've defined your state, you've declared your configuration, and now in three, you're enforcing that. And four is a report of all the changes. Anything that's changed, anything that you're managing, anything you want to know about what's happening to your systems will get reported back in any number of ways. In all of these instances, everything I talk about, we're very extensible, very customizable. So when I say we do reporting, we don't just have like the thing that you go back and here's what your report is and that's all you ever get. We have this raw data that many different handlers support. One of them is putting it up in a web browser, one of it's sending off to syslog, you can write your own, then there are many others built in. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Any questions about this workflow here? Does this model what you do when you manage your systems now? What does it look like now? If anybody wants to. So no simulation, you just, you, you. Okay. Is, is it? Yeah. Thank you, Alistair. I'm, I'm not paying him, but yes, that, that is what I was, that's the point I was looking to get to. <laughs> but also, like in, in step two, it's kind of like your lightsaber has an off switch. You know, like you can spin it around and see what's going to happen in the first versus what everybody's doing right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and that's a really big difference for us. And thank you, Alistair, for articulating it like that. 
It's instead of just saying, here's no, I'm serious. This is this is good because it's not just me up here saying, blah, 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 here's what Puppet does, you should all use it. And by the way, go buy the commercial edition so that I can go and have a steak or you know, whatever. Even though I'm vegetarian. <laughs> But I'll just get the steak and then show it to you, right? Uh, all right, so the whole concept here is that we're not a procedural language. We're very declarative. It's all about modeling the state you want. You don't just say, here's the actions I want you to take, here's the commands you're going to run, here's the package you're going to install, and then just, I hope it all works. I've done this on my test system. I'm pretty sure it's going to work, right? I've been there. I'm sure you have. It works sometimes, and when it doesn't, it sucks, and it ruins your day. And that simulation is really, really important in Puppet to saying, here's what would happen if I actually told it to make it happen. Real simulation, not just I've done this before and I've tested it and it should work, but this is what would actually occur. So in, as part of that, I really am asking you guys to think differently about management, about how you configure your systems. For one, Stop thinking of them as individual snowflakes. They are not individual snowflakes. They are not people, even though we give them names and we give them behaviors and we say, oh, you know, she's grumpy today or, or you know, he's having a bad day or something like that. That's not true, right? We do that because things in our systems change without our knowledge and then suddenly their behavior isn't what we expect, so they must be people. They must be like us. They're finicky and emotional and, you know, forget things or haven't slept all week like me. And Puppet's not about that. We want to treat our systems as these computers that we've spent tons of money and years and, and energy into building to be these repeatable things that'll always do what we tell them to do, and they'll just do it and do it and do it until we tell them to do something different. So machines are not individual snowflakes. Second, machines live after you deploy them. And this is part of they're not individual snowflakes, but when you deploy that golden image and the machine has all your applications and all your configuration and all your system preferences and everything like that, things will change. There will need to be new updates. Users who demand admin rights will change things. Users without admin rights will change things. They'll break things in their own home directory. That's something that you want to be maintaining, you want to fix. You want to do some things to protect the user from themselves while still giving them all the power they need and all the control they need and all the features they need. But you don't want to spend all your time answering help desk tickets, logging to machines and repairing. You should just be able to say, here's what things should look like in order to be working and just make it working all the time. So I don't have to focus on fixing your problem for the hundredth time. I'm focusing on how do I design a system that works beautifully for you and then how do I go and get really drunk? Right. That's what we're looking to do here. So systems aren't snowflakes. Systems change after you deploy them. And you want to know what's going on in your network. How many of you know what's changing on your network right now, honestly? And I'll tell you, even with Puppet, you can't really honestly raise your hand here. But you can get it halfway. Right? You can say that I've got a ton of data about what's going on, what's changing, and I know that the state looks like this, and I'm going to be told whenever the state doesn't look like that anymore. Information is really, really powerful, especially as you start to scale beyond a dozen machines to 100, 200, to 1,000. You want data on any time that herd starts to change. Because if all 1,000 of them change in a broken way, you don't want to know when your users come at you. You want to know beforehand and start correcting it. Or better yet, Puppet's going to correct it already. And then you can go and find the source of the change. Any questions so far? Can I keep moving my arms around? I notice that I do that a lot. I hope it's now I'm drawing attention to it and it's going to be worse. So this is an example of declaring a state in Puppet. This isn't a Mac specific example. It's just one I threw up there. I'll show you some Mac specific examples in a second. But Ideally, you've got a sense just by reading this without ever having learned Puppet language. Actually, how many of you have read Puppet's DSL before? Alistair, a couple of you. All right, so for those of you that haven't, does this make sense? I'm installing this package, I'm making sure it's present. And note, I keep saying that, but it's not about the action anymore. 
I'm not installing a package or erasing a package or upgrading a package. No actions, no action verbs for the rest of your puppet days. It's all about state. In this case, the state is present. And then we have a file and all the things we care about about a file. In this case, we care about its owner, its group, its mode. We have this require statement, which is something in Puppet's language to create a relationship between something and something else. One of the things I mentioned here, it's not a top-down parse. We're not a procedural language, so we're not going to read through the file and say, oh, well, we're going to do this package, then we're going to do this file, then we're going to do something else. Because ideally, well, not ideally, realistically, you are going to have files with hundreds of lines, and you're going to have thousands of those files because you have complex networks with a lot of needs. And Puppet forces you to think in this modular manner. Here's this idea of a thing I want to do, and here's the relationships on how to make it work in the way I want. And then I have a thousand of those other ideas. And then I'm going to stitch all of those ideas together to make an individual system. Right? This administrator needs this service and this package, and this one needs a slightly different set. You don't have to redo that work every time. You've already defined what each of those ideas looks like. And it looks like this. Packages, files, services, users, groups, cron jobs, all these custom types that I'll show you. And at the bottom, you say service, and we have the state stopped, enable, false, right? I want the service to always be off, and I don't want it to start at boot. Right? Any questions about what you're seeing here? Is that something that's based on an interval It's whenever the puppet daemon is active and checking in and doing its, its going through that loop. So puppet does this loop by default every 30 minutes. And of course, that's configurable to whatever you want. Some people like to do an hour, a day, every minute. Right? You have that option. And then every time the puppet runs, it'll look at what you've defined. It'll simulate what's going to happen. It'll enforce it if you've told it to enforce and send a report back every single one of those loops. And that defined step is here. And note, we're also only giving Puppet the information about the things that we care about. I can have a user up here and just say, I want him present. Don't care what his GID is. Don't care what his home is. Don't care what his group is. Figure it out, Puppet. And Puppet will. But you care about these things. And Puppet will only manage these things. Puppet's not a product that you install onto your system and it suddenly manages your whole system. And that's to our, to our benefit. Phil. So basically what you're saying is that even though I can get administrative rights out to my systems, um, I can guarantee that nobody is running SSH, SSHD, or say IIS on a Windows box. Um, basically I can tell Puppet to make sure that service is turned off if they turn it off. Exactly. Every time Puppet would run to check the desired state versus the known state, it'll enforce it. Right? Turn the service off, fix your permissions on the file, and this source line says that I have an authoritative source for this file. It's living on the Puppet master. If that file changes locally, the Etsy SSH SSH underscore config, if that file ever changes locally, Puppet's going to change it back. It's going to tell you exactly what bits changed. It's going to give you a diff of the difference. No, no, it's so it's not, we're not like tripwire in that space where we're always monitoring things and telling you who took what action and did what. But, you know, if it will tell you any of these properties that changed, what the previous property was. So let's say that you have this file in your system and Sam became the owner of it. Puppet will tell you the owner was Sam. You told me it should be root, so I've corrected it to root. So you can get that kind of indication of what's been changing. Does this happen through a client piece that runs on each desktop? Mm -hmm. Yep. There's a client piece that runs on each desktop. The code is all located on the Puppet Master. Is, is file bucket functional? Yep. So one of the what, what Alistair is alluding to, file bucket is anytime a local file changes on the system, you can optionally have Puppet send the file from the local machine up to the Puppet Master and store it in what's called the file bucket so that you have a copy of any local edits that Puppet's overwritten. In case some local admin was really making a change that he wanted to keep, he didn't put it into version control, he doesn't remember what he typed, you still have a copy of that. It's not backup, it's more like fail safe. And as far as your question, I think the next slide 
is talking about the relationships. So the puppet master is where all that code lives. <coughs> and this is an important piece, because like I said, you're gonna have thousands of those files that represent ideas of how you wanna deploy to your systems. And each, what we call a node in Puppet's terminology, only knows about the configuration that it's been told to run. It doesn't have any information about anyone else on your network, just the configuration that it's been told. So we have the Puppet Master in the middle. On the bottom we have nodes. You could scale to thousands of nodes with this. For instance, Zenga runs all of their web games. Blizzard runs World of Warcraft. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of nodes. Anybody playing World of Warcraft in here? Phil, you're playing World of Warcraft. Put your hand up. We have two in the room. I actually quit. What's that? So do you mean currently? Or? Yeah, Cur yeah I currently. I was playing too, and now I'm thinking about getting back into it. And apparently there's a scroll of resurrection. If you buy a year pass of World of Warcraft, you get Diablo 3 for free, plus you get like level 80 and all this crap. I'm just thinking, I'm not, I might as well quit my job. I'm just never going to never gonna live again. So, question. How heavy is Puppet? It's lightweight. So Puppet, I forgot to mention this earlier, Puppet's written in Ruby. So it's a Ruby-based Ruby daemon that takes, I don't know, a couple of megs. Let's see if I have Puppet running on my uh, desktop here. Oh, it's up there. Give me just a second. don't have Puppet running, let me run it for you. Yeah. <laughs> I hate you. All right, let's see if that's running now. All right, so there's 15 megs. 15 megs of the daemon, this is just starting up, so it's probably gonna go back down, and obviously no CPU time. So you're only really gonna be doing CPU time when you're checking into the master. The daemon is just running in the background. It's just kind of waiting there for its triggered event. It's keeping track of time is really all it's doing. And you can configure that out of cron. If you don't like that 15 megabyte imprint, kick it off to cron and, uh, and just have it you know, check in every 30 minutes or so. The nice thing about having Puppet Daemon running in the background is that you can then reach out with Puppet or M Collective, which I'll talk about in a bit, to modify the service, to stop the service, to change how often it runs. You have some control pieces that are kind of nice by having the Daemon running in the background. So, lightweight, Ruby-based Daemon. The master runs also Ruby-based Daemon. Uh, the Puppet Enterprise comes to fault with Apache running with Passenger. It's a mod, like mod rail or mod Ruby uh, for, for Apache. If you do run Puppet in production, don't use the default WebRick server. It's for testing out Puppet, developing on Puppet. Put it behind Apache or Nginx. Scale it like a web application because it is like a web application. It's just a Ruby application that you run, serve it over it, port 8140, and scale it horizontally. Any of you running in production with WebRick? You guys using Apache? A couple of you said you were running in production. You guys are using Apache? Okay. Yeah. It's not too hard on the open source. The enterprise version does it for you. And you can manage up to 10 nodes for free with the enterprise version and kind of dissect what it does if you really want to, if you want to put the effort in and see what we do in the enterprise version and use it in open source. You know, we're not going to hate you. You don't get commercial support. You know, that's what you're paying for. So. Do you have education pricing? Uh, I think we do. Yeah. Who said yes? yes. You've, you've inquired? All right, so being a startup, we have pricing models that are all over the rainbow because we have like, here's our model and talk to us and we'll do something entirely different. <laughs> right? It's, it's a startup. We, we want to sell product. We want people to use Puppet. So we're willing to work with you. And I think, as Alistair mentioned, we do have like an EDU pricing structure that can be talked about. So where was I going with all of this? Uh, so you have the master, which contains all that code, which defines here are all the things about my system, my services, this application that I want to deploy, these things I want to manage. Then the agent checks into the master. This is all inbound connectivity, even though our marketing people put an arrow going back down again. It's all connectivity from the agent to the master. So the only firewall hole you have to poke is on the master side. 
and we have this tool called Factor. Is that the next slide? No, all right, we'll get to Factor in a second. Just to reiterate my point, we have a desired state, and that's what you represented in the code. This is what I want to happen. This is what I have. That's your desired state. Then you have node state there on the left, which is what the machine is doing right now. Puppet will compare the desired state to the known state, and it will converge any differences. Unless you're simulating, then it'll just tell you what's different. Does this model make sense? Again, we're not procedural. We're about declaring state, and then we're enforcing that state. And of course, we report back. So, interacting with all the different uh, systems, we have what's called the resource abstraction layer. And this is just a very small subset, but let's say you're managing a package or a service or a user. We have wit written Ruby code. I can't talk apparently. We've written Ruby code to interact with all these things. Here's how I interact with yum. Here's how I interact with you know, RPM and so on and so forth. So that when you say I want package foo ensure present, you don't have to figure out what commands to run. You don't have to tell Puppet the difference between the platforms in case the things are similar between your Windows clients, your Mac clients, your Linux servers, all of that. Any questions about this? Again, it's just Ruby code. Our package provider on the enterprise side, for instance, has I think more than 33 providers now. There's things in there. What am I looking for? Yeah, there's Macport. Somebody's got Brew on the Forge. There's Gem. There's App DMG. There's Apple PKG. All kinds of stuff. All right, so it's just instructions on how to interact with these things so that you don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to show you one now that I just whipped up last night. It's the model that we follow, how we achieve all this stuff in Puppet is actually ridiculously simple. Right? These three things. Can I check to see if it exists? Can I create it? Can I destroy it? So let's take a look. This, model this is for all resources in Puppet, that's the model. Okay. Right? For all those things that you saw in this slide, Puppet knows how to check to see if that thing exists and the state of all those properties, right? What's the owner? What's the group? And then it knows how to create and destroy or modify those things. So the one I whipped up last night, actually, source modules, profile handler. Yeah, I rewrote it to be the puppet way um, last night. I did have a module out there for managing OS X configuration profiles, but it was based on um, a tool Google wrote in Python. It was like a service that was running in the background that would check profiles on the system and install them and destroy them. Does anybody use that? I forget what it was called. It's one of those things they host up there, like cauliflower vest and everything else. So not crank D. Sorry? Not crank D. Not crank D. It was something, something else. Um, crank D being more. More specialized. Uh, so here is what makes up a Ruby type. Most of this is documentation. But here I say it's insurable, which is telling Puppet I know how to check th that the thing exists or not. And then I say, here are the properties I want the profile and the name of it. Really stupid simple. <coughs> you don't have to learn Ruby code to enjoy it. You just have to know Ruby code to write it, which is not something I'm asking you to do. And this is a bit of a hack at the moment. I need to rewrite it to do Ruby parsing of text instead of using grep. But there's create, destroy, and exists. It's a slightly different order than the slide. But create, I'm using the profiles command, giving it dash i, dash f, and the path to the configuration profile that I want to install. On the destroy method, profiles dash r, dash p, and the identifier, resource name. So com.apple. whatever the configuration profile is. That destroys it. Exists tells Puppet I'm going to do a grep and then check the exit code because it was late and I wanted to show it to you. Does this make sense? Don't, don't worry about the Ruby code of it. Does the logic make sense? Uh, no, this is all about just taking those profiles that you've built and managing them with Puppet in case you don't want to use Apple's profile manager. Just applying 
Right. This is version 001. Version maybe 1.0 might have more features. I, this is really, I wanted to show you how simple the model is. You had a question. So you're just creating an object that has the method that has the default things that's referenced in your model. Yep. Are there other questions about this before I show you the end result? All right, so let's take a configuration profile. Let's see, um, configuration utility. Forgot that I've mirrored these screens now. So here's a configuration profile I built last night for um, those three of you that were at Penn State. This is for the central Zimbra service as an exchange clone. And all I'm doing here is I've created edu.psu.ucsActiveSync and I'm deploying an ActiveSync payload. Somebody told me one time that there was, a, there was a piece of software like this for Mac profiles instead of the, uh, OS or the iOS profiles that do work on Macs. Is that true? Yeah. What's it called? Profile, profile manager. Well, how do you get it? Oh, you have to have server. Yeah. Was, is it in server tools as well? No, there's no offline version. You can be running the process and then interact with the web page. Really? All right. <laughs> because I was, I was trying to figure that out last night because I was going to use those profiles instead of this, but this works, right? I think you guys know this works. I will have to go and, and uh, use that later. But anyway, this is the profile I built. I exported it. I have it here in my car. Uh, one, nine, two. Can't type when I'm thinking about what to do next. 150. And I don't want root, I want Ryan. So I'm going to log into this VM. And I'm going to prove to you that there are no profiles on it, unless I forgot to roll back my snapshot. All right, so there's no profiles tab. There's no profiles being managed. This is a vanilla 10.7.3. I've already pre-installed, um, not in trash, downloads. I've pre-installed Puppet and Factor, which we have DMGs on downloads.puppets, downloads.puppetlabs.com. So I have that pre-installed, but that is it. Uh, let me switch back to my terminal. And can, anyone, can everyone see this text? Is this all good? All right. So where do I want to go? I was going to do an EC2-based demo, but uh, the internet's being a little weird, so I'm just going to run it locally. So in here, manifests, ch -ch 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 profiles. So this is what that resource type looks like. That Ruby code that I just showed you models like this in Puppet's language. Actually, not quite like this. Forgot to show you a step. Sorry, folks. One second. Make it bigger. Profiles handler, view, samples. There we go. That's what I wanted to show you. So I do a couple of things here, but I'm abstracting that away. That resource that I built is this bottom one, which is in nice Easter colors that you can't read. The profile manager, the name that we're going to give it, ensure whatever, you know, present or absent. Then we're going to give it the actual path to a profile, which is going to be deployed down to a Mac, and it's going to be stored in Puppet's Varder. We do this so that the configuration profile is always local. In case you can't contact the Puppet Master, or maybe you're running without Puppet Masters, you could always enforce that profile. Let's say somebody with a laptop is running off and they delete the profile, or something gets screwed up, and they want to be able to apply it. Puppet's still running in the background, can't contact the Puppet Master, falls back to this local profile. So that's what we're doing here. So I'm just deploying a couple of files. By the way, in the lab that's going to happen this afternoon, how much time do I have, by the way? What time does this end? Anybody know? You should. 12. 12? All right. Thank you, Phil. I know you guys wanted to end now. But if you are coming to the lab, uh, we'll be walking through some of this code, writing some of our own, uh, and just kind of managing all the Macs and basically breaking everything in, in 209 or 109 or whatever it is. 
So if you want to come to that, come prepared with things you want to do with Max, with Puppet. I have a, a list of examples that we can run through, but I'd like to write Puppet code with you and manage things. So that segue aside, let's go back to actually doing this demo. This is the end result. This says, here's the profile that I want to install. Here's where I get it. In this case, it's in my module already. Files, flies. In here, I have an mcollective installer, but here is my mobile config, right, and TextMate. So let's do that. So normally, a Puppet Master is going to be checking in and giving all these things back to the agent, but I don't want to risk that at the moment. So I'm going to run this command, which is going to say, here's where I find my modules. Here's that example code that I want to run. I'm going to authenticate with some password. Hey, I got the right one. And Mac Profiles Handler, what do I have wrong here? Oh, I don't have the right module in. All right, let's try the EC2 way. So I do have this enterprise console for those of you that are interested in the, the GUI. Um, I'm going to show this to you later in the lab when we do some mem collective stuff. But let's go in and find Ryan's Mac. Actually, screw that. Let's go command line, guys. All right, so in here, I'm just going to declare the classes that I want. If I go back to this, this is the, this is the code that I want to run. So I'm just going to put this in here, just because I'm a little bit unprepared there. And then I'm just going to run, not here, over here, agent-t. So Puppet Master has a set of instructions telling it what to do. And now I'm actually going to run Puppet Agent. Let's see if this works. It's going to connect up to EC2 all the way in the West Coast. So that's where it's cheap. All right, there's my configuration file. It couldn't retrieve the file itself, so I'm going to go back and correct that on my EC2 machine. So here I have in PSU Mac admins files. PSU UCS dot mobile config, and I'm wondering whether I screwed this up. Yeah, I don't know what that was. So this is the config that we actually want to deploy. Oh, right, because I was shipping an example. I changed this about 10 minutes ago so I could put it up on the web so you guys could download it, and none of this content's correct. So there is EPU. That's what I get for trying to be nice. Uh, am I? OK. All right, so now I have pointing at the right thing, and that's not my module. It is PSU underscore Mac admins. And by the way, all this code that I will be doing today here and in the lab, I did put it up on the web. I'll show you the URL in a few minutes. And it did just screw me over, so you guys better like it. All right, let's try that again with the correct code on the Puppet Master. It is going to try to retrieve that mobile config profile and install it. It's loading all of its facts, which we'll talk about in just a second. There's the profile. There is it being created. It dropped it down on the local disk. Again, varlib puppet, just in case you can't contact the Puppet Master. We still want to be able to manage these profiles. It is installing it. And now it's going through, I think it's going through its report phase. So let's flip over to the Mac. Maybe it's still working on deploying it. There's profiles, and there is the UCS profile, right? hoop de da we installed a profile. Yeah, thank you. So what happens if we, I'm sorry? It's there. Yeah, it's there. Is it mail? I don't actually have a UCS account anymore, so I can't do much more than tell you Let's see. Oh, man, I hate this. Come on, Apple. Hey, here's my email address. 
<laughs> Where would it be? I'd have to get past this point and go into accounts, right? Oh, it's system preferences mail? I could do it there? <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right, so apparently it's not there, but the profile's there. So that means I didn't build a correct profile. Thank you, Alistair. <laughs> yeah, is this an iOS only thing? All right, so screw you guys, I'm going home. <laughs> I built a profile, it worked, I, or I, you know, the profile built and I deployed it, so it's in the profiles tab. If you build a correct profile, it might actually do things on the system. We can do that as part of the lab. Let's build a real profile as part of the lab. In fact, let's go back 30 seconds. Yes, Alistair, that is intentional. We're going to build a real profile in the lab today. <laughs> All right, so I've removed that profile. It is gone. And of course, I think you know what's going to happen. I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to run Puppet again. And Puppet is going to correct things. If I went in and said ensure absent instead of ensure present, Puppet would remove it for me. But in this case, let's say you've got Puppet running every 30 minutes, every 10 minutes, every minute, whatever you want, it's going to manage the profiles. All right, does that make sense? That's how simple this model is and creating a custom resource type. If you're even the teensiest bit familiar with Ruby, it's pretty dead simple. You start to do more complex things, then you need to know a little bit more about Ruby. But lots of community members have contributed stuff like this, and that's pretty cool. I'll show you a couple more examples, and then I will finish up the slides. I only have a couple more. Actually, no. Let's go back to the slides first, just in case. Then I will show you more examples. Any questions about what you just saw? You only have to do that on the server? Yeah, just on the server. The, uh, so Puppet will automatically distribute all of the plugins to the, to the agent. So all you have to do is, is build it on the master, put it in the right place, and it'll just distribute down. Then in that, in that type, you probably didn't see it, but I said this type only applies to OS X. So it'll only try to work on OS X, right? Assuming you have a heterogeneous environment. So thank you, that's a good question. All right, I forgot, I have one slide to the, to the cloud code. Uh, segue, just for a joke, I went looking for Mac authorization on Apple's website, and this is how they feel uh, the internet and cloud and data and authorization looks like. I thought it was kind of funny. Obviously, you guys don't, but look at that. They're saying, we're going to drive a van into some room with this laser guard, and that's where your files live. Really? <laughs> that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got another startup going about this concept. So. Is that a van or is that a pickup truck with a shell on it? <laughs> yeah, it does not look like a, a van that I would normally use. So that is a good segue, or at least a terrible segue, into, uh, let's see. I want to go into PSU again, and I'll show you something else. This is probably more appropriate. Well, how many of you are using Kerberos? Like straight Kerberos, not Apple's. Okay, the hands went down as soon as I added that qualifier. I should have left them up. Uh, let's see. I want to show you Curb 5. So those of you that are from Penn State or those of you that want to do this bit in uh, Etsy authorization, everyone ever edited Etsy authorization in here? Is this applicable to some of you? All right, for those of you that haven't, since there is a fair number who haven't, Let's take a look at Etsy authorization. It's this file that Apple deploys for managing all these rights. It's this big key value pair list. System console. By the way, you need to make sure you edit that correctly. I've lost myself out of my own Yeah. I did this for you, Swazi. One time I actually had to show him how to do the single, single user reboot because he, he screwed up this key and then he couldn't, couldn't log in anymore. So screwed. So yeah, that's the thing, guys. Don't give your Windows admins rights on your Macs. It makes for a much better day. So anyway, system.login.console is this key here. And one of the things in here is built-in authenticate privileged. And if you want to do Kerberos on the Mac that isn't open directory, you have to add, change that line to this. Built-in curb 5 auth no verify, leave the privileged. And this is a built-in puppet type for managing that. It looks a little wonky. You kind of have to 
Go ahead. It's 10.6 only, right? I mean, well, not 10.6 only, but it's not applicable to 10.7? So. No, totally applicable to 10.7. I'm running 10.7, and this is, yeah, totally applicable to 10.7. Um, I haven't integrated Kerberos with 10.7, if that's more your question. But as far as Etsy authorization being relevant, yes, 10.7 is relevant for Etsy authorization. Uh, so anyway, that is what this is, and Puppet can manage it. One of the other tools I want to show you, in case you feel like this is really difficult to just type out, I actually cheated. We have this command called Puppet Resource, which allows you to inspect the system. Like if I put in user here, I would inspect all the, all the bits, which will take a minute. Yeah. My machine is, is pretty abused today. Where are you from? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. So I'm from Portland, Oregon. Anybody else Portland, Oregon in here? You're from Portland, Oregon. That's great. It's good to see you guys. So there are all of our users, right, just in Puppet's format. So it's a way of inspecting the current state of the system. This is part of how Puppet does its state business. It uses the resource abstraction layer to inspect everything and pair what it sees here versus what you've told it to do. So I can put in Mac authorization here type that through less because it's huge. And there, see that was a lot faster. My system must have been, I have Windows running in the background too. I should have turned that off. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so there's system.login.console, so that's where I stole it from. It builds all of that for you in Puppet's format, so you can just rip this off, change the bits you need, and manage it with Puppet. So that's a pretty cool feature of Puppet in my opinion. Any questions on this so far? That's Mac authorization. Related. How many, uh, how many Mac OS X specific providers uh, are generally available? I've had a problem finding. So the, it's a little light right now. It was okay. it was big. Yeah, it's not just you. And please come to the lab today, or at least email me or Twitter me or something with ideas for providers. Because at this point, we just need to know what people want to do, and then we log tickets, and then somebody, probably me, probably Gary Larissa, somebody in the, in Puppet Labs that uses Macs will build them. Right. So information about a couple last pieces before I let you guys go. Factor is an extra piece that gets all kinds of information about your system. So let's go back and demo that over here. Pseudo factor, get all the puppet ones. And there is all this stuff. It's key value pairs, information that is being gathered in real time every time you run factor. And puppet runs factor every time it runs. So all of this information is available for you, your use when you're running or writing your code, rather. So imagine you need something to change whenever the IP address of a system changes. You can have Puppet use this. You can use that in conjunction with CrankD for triggering a Puppet run as soon as the interface changes instead of going through all of CrankD stuff to change your IP, right? Things of that nature. So System Profiler, I think I've heard people talk about it throughout the conference, and I moved too fast there. There's a bunch of stuff going on there from System Profiler, and I'm going to write a System Profiler fact for getting um, all the installed profilers, because you can do that with System Profiles. I mix those two words. Mm -hmm. Swap profiler and profiles, and it'll make sense. Any questions about factor? It's key value pairs. Where's the key uh, so this can be stored on disk in YAML format, but right now I have it configured to just do it on demand every time you run it. So every time Puppet's invoked, it gets real data. But you can cache that as well. So if we grab that with other tools? You can grab that with other tools, and it will output neither JSON or YAML for you. Yeah, and Factor, by the way, is a completely separate tool. So if you walk away from here, and you just want to be able to get all this inventory data and write your own code, you can do that. You don't ever have to use Puppet, though we recommend you do. So here's my fact that I wrote real quick for doing profiles. All right, so I have the profile in there. It's pretty easy to do those. I think I have a slide on writing one. That's all there is to it. You can copy and paste this boilerplate puppet code. And where it says role, that's the name of the fact, like profiles. Over here in cat etsy role, it's a command you would run that will return what you want to return for the role fact. Does that make sense? Right? It's very simple. Puppet is actually a really ridiculously simple model that enables you to do really complex things. So this is getting information from your system. Any other questions? So 
these modules. I want to just take a brief segue, talk to you about where to get this kind of content. There was a question about where you would get providers for Mac. This is one of my personal pet projects is to make this more valuable for Mac admins. Right now, if you type in Mac, you get two of them, and they're both me. If you do OSX, you get the yeah. uh, defaults. Defaults, yeah. Thank you, Alistair. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I, you're ruining my jokes. All right. So there is one other OS X provider. Some, some guy's written this. Is he in the room? That's too bad, because it's cool that there's other people doing this. It's for managing defaults. The bad news is it doesn't quite work. So I'm going to have to figure out why it doesn't work and contribute patches back. And then it will work, and we'll have a couple of extra providers. But this is forge.puppetlabs.com. This is where you can go to search for things like, I don't know, Apache, and get back code that people have already written that you can use as examples. And hopefully, someday, you'll be able to take things. In fact, you can take this, you, the Mac Profile Handler. That's what I just demonstrated. You can download this and use this right away. Right? It's, it should be a repository for pre-written code that is useful right out of the box. And what I was showing you on the slide is the command line interface for that, which is in Puppet as of 2714, where you can install, search, and you know, manage what we call Puppet modules. What is this slide? All right, so, oh, I, so I'm stealing some slides from Gary here, and apparently he likes transitions. Um, M Collective, that's it. This is from the author, Ari Pinar. What is this transition business? OK, Ari Pinar. All right, so this is M Collective in, in short, right? We have the client, which is like your puppet agent. There's an M Collective agent. Again, a Ruby-based daemon. Then it subscribes to a message queue. Anyone familiar with ActiveMQ in here? One, two. OK, so it's a highly scalable message bus system. It's a Java-based process that runs on the server that creates a message bus that has, you know, it's called topics and queues. But basically, it's this big, wide pipe that people throw messages into, those people being the collective. They're throwing things in there. They're saying, go do this. Tell me what information you have. Are you a Mac? Things like that. And all the clients subscribe to that queue and get that information. And it's much more scalable than point to point. We're not doing this, I'm going to pull, connect, pull, connect. The server can just drop something into a queue. All the clients are already listening to the queue. It's a very low bandwidth connection. And they can just do all their processing locally. So that is M Collective. <laughs> really? Sorry, guys. That's how it works. So compared to ARD, um, one of the things that's really cool about M Collective, and they're not comparing them is a little bit wrong because they're not really fighting the same space. But similar mentality. If you want to reach out and get information from your systems, M Collective does that better than ARD because of no discovery and filtering, which I'll show you in the lab once I have all 30 machines built. I can show you it here, but it's not very impressive because I have like one machine. <coughs> Uh, so, PE admin. So, I can ping all my machines from the West Coast, and I can get inventory from, say, one of these guys and get back all their factor data. All right? And what if I say MCO find with fact? Uh, let's see, what's the syntax? Give me just a second. There it is. With fact kernel equals Darwin. All right, something like that. And it'll go out and find all the machines there. And there are other commands that I'll show you when we have more time in the labs. But basically, you can reach out, get fact data, say, you know, when is this machine, give me all the Macs that have more than 8 gigs of RAM, or maybe less than 8 gigs of RAM. Gary Larissa wrote a warranty fact that'll go out and query, will curl off of Apple's website and tell you if your machines are out of warranty. So you could do an M Collective transaction to say, who's out of warranty right now? All right, so things like that. M Collective is about broadcast and discovery. It's in real time. It's doing all those transactions, dropping a message to that queue. All the clients analyze it and return a response if applicable. So that's node discovery, node selection and filtering. We'll go into that more later. Command execution. It's Ruby-based agents that describe what you want to be able to do. I'm going to show you how you can interact with the Puppet resource abstraction layer to say, 
I want to install a package. I want to restart a service. Actions like that. Somebody's written a, a bash thing where you can just give it bash scripts, but that's not the puppet way, so I won't be showing you that. Input parsing, it'll validate what's going in. It'll give you that data back out in plain text, in YAML, in JSON. I think Ari did something else as well. And you can do timeouts and blocking, meaning you can wait for a slow network to respond. Any of you using ARD on slow networks or distributed networks? Are you happy with it? Yeah, see? I don't see any heads going like this. They're all going like that because ARD is just not that product, right? It's really great for work groups, small machines, reliable network, doing things the Apple way. And that's great, but you do things the puppet way and you get a different set of behavior, which we feel is better. Your mileage may vary. So that's M Collective and how it all fits together. You've got Puppet, which is declaring your state. You say, here's what I want. Puppet makes sure that it's enforcing that at whatever interval you want. Again, you describe these ideas in a modular sense. Here's what it takes to deploy, a pet, to deploy Adobe Photoshop. Here's the services that I wanted to manage on my system. And then you include all those services together on an individual box. So here's a really important point about that. Like you're building these Lego bricks, the work you've done to figure out how to manage this particular thing on your Mac, you are done forever. You don't have to do that again on the next new five employees machines or when somebody breaks it. Once you've spent the time to figure out how to do something and to model it in Puppet's language, you're done. You can just declare that class now on somebody's machine and say, this is, I want them to do this now. Does that make sense? You're modeling your systems as code. You can do code review with your peers. One of the coolest things at AIT for me when I was building out our Linux servers in Puppet was being able to walk over to Jake's office and say, hey, does this look like how we want to deploy this service? Well, yeah, well, I want to move this file here, this service, really, it's, you know, should be this or that or the other. I can do code review without having to, with a shared set of vocabulary and a shared language to write on. That code is backed by Git or SVN or whatever version control you're doing. So you can roll out changes to your infrastructure in a tiered way with branching and merging. You can collaborate with others on that code. If you roll something out and it breaks everything, you just revert your commit to the state that you know did work and Puppet will reapply that state. It's not so much roll back as much as roll forward, right? So those are the kind of things you get from this. On the other side of that, you have M Collective, which all, is all about broadcasting and finding out what you have on your network, taking actions on those machines that meet that criteria, all done in real time, all done really reliably, even on distributed networks. The guy who wrote it before he joined Puppet Labs just wrote it for himself because he ran a consultant company that had servers in Africa, uh, Germany, Australia, and United States, and slow links, right? He wanted to be able to do reliable transactions across everything. A couple pieces on getting help. We can talk about these again in the lab if you choose to join me. If you do join me, we will be writing code. I will be providing TextMate for you in case you don't want to use VI. But we will be writing code. We will be working on the command line. If that's not your thing, uh, check out docs.puppetlabs.com. Learn more. When you get comfortable with it, you know, send me a tweet or something, and, and I can point you in the right direction and get you started. Uh, but we are a command line driven tool. We have a graphical console for interacting with things and for looking at reports, but most of the time you're on the command line. These slides will be available online as well. Anybody use IRC in here? Okay, Puppet on Freenode, hugely popular. Lots of great help to get on Puppet on IRC. Also, pound pound OS X dash server. It's uh, great for, great for uh, OS X help, server based. Uh, so Puppet Describe is our command line documentation tool. You give it the type you want to learn more about, like Puppet Describe, Mac authorization, for instance. It'll tell you about all the options that you can, uh, that you can do. And that's it. A couple of credits. G. Larissa gave me the M Collective slides. Actually, I took them. I didn't ask, so don't tell him. And uh, Mosin has a couple other Puppet modules that aren't on the Forge yet, but he's got a number of things that I would like to show you real quick. Yeah, so I've been in contact with him, trying to get him to update the code. I'm going to be contributing patches and then get them out in the forge where they're working. But the kind of things he's working on, managing ARD, he's got a plist provider. Power management does work. I'm going to use this in the lab. That's kind of cool. Uh, cups would be great if it worked, but it didn't. So we're working on, on that with him. 
Um, and he's got some other stuff in there, a bunch of puppet-based stuff. So thanks to Mosin for getting us 90% you know, of the way. I'm going to help him get that last percentage. And the code that I've demonstrated and the code we'll be using in the lab is here. And that's, that's me. If you have any questions, um, feel free to ask now. You can always hit me on Twitter all the way back at the beginning because I didn't think to put it at the end. At Ryan Y. Coleman. Rusty wants this mic. So if anybody has questions, feel free to shout it out. You get a mic or I'll repeat it. I think most of you are asking questions as we went, so it's, I'll, you know, I will hate you personally if you don't ask questions. I just have a simple question. Pros and cons versus FileWave? I'm not familiar with FileWave. Very similar. Okay. We have FileWave on our campus. I don't actually administer that part of it, but a lot of the functions seem similar. Okay. I'm not familiar with FileWave. I do know that our declarative model and the simulation are unique to us. Um, at least as far as our marketing team has discovered, and they know a lot more about all the various products in the space. But I don't know enough about FileWave to give you a, an honest opinion. I would suggest you to try both out. It's pretty easy to get started and then do a comparison yourself. Other questions? Okay, I can repeat it. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So you would. So the question was, how do you manage uh, different states where you have like a teacher's laptop, a student's laptop? You have some kind of different conditions. Maybe they're even different platforms. Maybe the teacher uses Mac. Maybe the student runs Windows. Something like that. The answer is, you can have different classes of code, which say these are different things that apply per system. But we also have conditional logic in our in our code to say if something, if some value do something else. And how you would use that is with factor to say, if I'm on a Windows system, here's what I'm gonna do to manage this SSH thing. And if I'm on a Mac system, I'm gonna do something slightly different, right? I'm gonna change the paths or something else. And if you have some way of determining whether someone is a student or a teacher, you can put that information in factor and use that to make decisions in your manifests. You know, teachers are gonna get admin rights, students are gonna get even more restricted rights. Right, something like that. You could definitely do that with conditional logic in our language, and facts are the gateway for that information. And you can even just put plain text facts in there to say, this is a student machine. This is a you know you could put that as part of your image if you don't have a way of dynamically generating it. Did you have a question? Or you just yeah. How does uh, M Collective deal with offline notes, or do you have any way to deal with offline notes? So M Collective will not deal with offline notes. M Collective is about discovering what's live, what's out there now. Um, Puppet on the other side will handle offline nodes, it will cache things, it will send data back up. And then so we, what we do then is have things like the inventory service and the report service, which will always have the cache data. And it, so just to repeat the question, how does M Collective deal with, how would you deal with offline nodes? The M Collective piece doesn't. It's about discovering what's online now and doing things with them. You can give it a list of nodes that you know should be up and it'll tell you which ones aren't up. But it's not going to wait and do those actions later. RE is sort of addressing that problem in M Collective 2.0, which is open source out now. It will be in your commercial product probably in another six months. It will, you can specify to it, I need these actions to occur against these nodes. And if it doesn't happen in the order I want against all the nodes in this list, you will wait until that's done. So that feature for M Collective is coming, but it's not there yet. Puppet, on the other hand, will collect all that data, will send it back up once the master's done. Nodes with static host names and IPs. Uh, in the past, when I've looked at it for managing clients that had a problem, oh, Puppet Excels with static, ho static host names, static IPs, servers. In the past, when I've looked at it for managing clients, I had issues with clients constantly changing IPs and Puppet not, sh not sure what node this is and what to apply. Okay. So it, uh, it may have gotten better with that now. I, I haven't been, I haven't experienced that with Puppet. So IP address is one of those facts you get uh, from Factor. And so you can, in your manifest, when you know that IP is sensitive and when the IP address changes, you need to do something different, you would put that in your code and use the IP address. And then every time Puppet runs, it'll recheck that IP address and make the changes appropriately. Right. Well, no, well, that, so, what I'm talking about is it, it kept thinking it was a new node. Okay, right. so, so that's when the oh, cert so, name is based yeah. off of. Okay, DNS. now I know what you're talking about. So certificate name used to be based on host name, and now it is more statically set. 
So, the, so everything in Puppet is encrypted with SSL, and we use SSL for authorizing both the master and the agent pieces. And that certificate name is set whenever the machine first connects to the master. And you can tell it, here's what the cert name is. Some people like to dynamically change their cert names, but that will be static on subsequent runs, even when the host name or IP address change. There was a bug back in like two five days on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. That has been fixed. Now I know what you, now I know what you mean. Is there other questions in here? This is great. Does anybody feel like coming to the lab later? We can always continue things. A number of you. Okay. So we could of course continue this. And I guess um, if anybody wants to stick around, I'll be here. Otherwise, I'll see you in the lab and uh, enjoy your lunch. And thanks for coming. It's great having all of you.